Yes. I think that there are several factors in Puritan preaching that have gripped me over the years. One is certainly that they make me honest with myself. Um, they don't flatter you, they don't butter you up, they expose you, they make you vulnerable before God. But when they tear down your self-righteousness, they also build you up in Christ and preach him to the full. So I think the, the whole ancient cliche of the Puritans that a good preacher is one who exalts God to the highest and abases man to the lowest, which is so good for the soul, so you worship and just praise him alone. That comes through almost all the Puritan preachers. That's been very, very good for my soul. And then more specifically, I think that this whole thing that I call experiential preaching, and they often called experimental preaching, which really means the same thing, that focuses on the work of the Holy Spirit in the soul and traces that out in the soul so that you give glory to God. Not that you end it in morbid introspection, but that you end up giving all the glory to God and you seek to grow in grace and the stress on progressive sanctification. That's been very, very good for my soul. And um, they just seem to speak to me like no other group of writers in church history. It, it, they draw you in. You know, I have a lecture on John Bunyan where I talk about his participatory pleading in his sermons. He, he makes you participate in the text. He draws you right into it. And that's where the Puritans were very good at, most of them anyway, not all. And don't forget there are some Puritans that never got reprinted because they had, they had books that flopped too. Uh, but, you know, for example, if Bunyan would preach on the, the barren fig tree, you know, he'd make it so graphic. He'd, in, he'd, he'd impersonate God talking with the sun, the vine dresser. And you felt like you were that tree as you read the sermon. And you, you, you're totally involved. And he plead with you to stop being a barren person and to flee to Christ. And there's such a real vital reality in their preaching that penetrates the depths of the soul and makes you, makes you naked before God. And I, I, I think that's it. I think the Puritans had reality in their sermons. It wasn't a show. It was nothing... They were, they were preaching as dying men to dying people of the living Lord. And that's, that's I think, what makes them so powerful. Some of my favorite Puritans uh, over the years, and don't forget 95% of their books are just repackaged sermons. So when you talk about Puritan writings, you're talking about Puritan sermons, basically. When I was 15 years old, I began reading the Puritans really in earnest, Thomas Watson was my favorite at the beginning because his sentences are short, pungent. Um, what, what Theodore Beza said of Calvin when he died, that every word he spoke weighed a pound. Um, that's how I feel about Thomas Watson. And you just take one sentence, association begets assimilation. Well, that'd take a whole paragraph for me to say that. <laughs> he says it in three words. So, um, and just, just really powerful and succinct. And then later on, I got involved with Thomas Brooks and I felt his ability to illustrate was so powerful. And I was moved by his preaching. He's a good illustrator. And then I moved more into John Bunyan for a while. Of course, Bunyan was just a tremendous preacher at being able to grasp people uh, where they're at and bring them to where he wanted them to be. That's what John Owen was jealous of in, in, in Bunyan's, Bunyan's preaching. I also love the preaching of Thomas Goodwin, though I wouldn't call him a model uh, for, for today's preaching uh, because he can be very um, challenging in terms of, you know, he wasn't the easiest Puritan to understand, but I love his exegetical depth. Now, if I can include Jonathan Edwards as the so-called last Puritan or the one that spills over the official, semi-official end of the Puritan age in the early 18th century. Um, I think Edwards would probably be the overall the best model.
I, I know of as, as a Puritan preacher in terms of exegeting and then applying and his, his graphic word choice, the way he combines biblical, doctrinal, experiential, and practical teaching. I say to my students, if I had to give you two preachers to really read in depth and really get to understand how they preach that could benefit you today, I would pick Jonathan Edwards and then actually a 19th century small p Puritan preacher, uh, Robert Murray McShane. Uh, McShane has a wonderful way of preaching that is short, succinct, he does all the right things, he exegetes well, he applies well, he searches the conscience well, he draws to Christ well, and he just does it in a, such a savory, sweet way. Well, I just gave two talks somewhere, I think the Banner Truth Conference or yeah, a year or two ago, maybe. First talk was how to preach like the Puritans today, and the second talk was how not to preach like the Puritans today. So there are things we should not do today. We should not preach uh, 40 sermons on conviction of sin, followed by 65 sermons on the benefits of Christ. Um, we should not go all over the Bible and have 200 citations of texts in one sermon. Uh, we admire the Puritans for that, but we have a different list, listening audience today. So there's a number of things we shouldn't do. Um, what we should do, like the Puritans, is know how to exegete well and know then how to apply. I think that's where we learn the most from the Puritans today, actually. Applying to different groups of people in the church. Today we've lost that. We speak to God's people in general, and we, we comfort them a lot, which is good, that's very important to do. But there's differences among God's people. Some are backsliding, some are beginners in grace. Do you give the same counsel to beginners of grace as to the advanced and assured? Well, sometimes, but sometimes there's nuances. And the Puritans are very good at bringing in these nuances so that when people walked out of the church service, over a period of time, not necessarily in every sermon, but everyone would feel like the preacher addressed me personally. It's very common for someone to feel in those days. Uh, I, I saw no man save Jesus only in the sermon. It was as if God was speaking just to me alone in the sermon because the preacher knew how to connect with different people. And same thing with the unbelievers. There's impressed but unconverted unbelievers. There's, there's uh, seeking unbelievers. There's hardened unbelievers. So we need, to, we need to learn to preach to different groups uh, within our church as well. And um, I, I think we've, we've lost that art for the most part. So when, when the Puritans would, would deal with various cases of conscience from the pulpit, as they called it, we would call it perhaps counseling cases, they would distinguish between babes in grace, young men in grace, fathers in grace, and they would, they would know how to search the conscience. They would know how to talk to backsliders about how to return. They would know how to examine you. They were soul physicians. And they knew what remedy, actually every remedy was Christ in one way, but, but they knew how to direct people to Christ from different angles. And they did everything in greater depth than we tend to do today. So they would uh, not just let you skate away easily from a sermon uh, by, by skating over the surface only. They, they'd bring you into the depths of your depravity. They'd bring you into the depths of your joys in Christ. And often people search their own consciences under Puritan preaching because they, they, were, they were very much focused on being more transformed and being more sanctified, being made more like Christ, and they, they stretched you and pushed you. And so their applications were quite searching, quite searching. And sometimes they would give you six or seven points of examination. And by the time you come out of the church service, you'd say, wow, I've got, I've got work to do with God. And uh, 
Puritans didn't mind beating you up a little bit in a church service and driving you more to the Lord. And I find that actually helpful, more helpful than a minister who just comforts me from beginning to end and I can leave feeling pretty good about myself. <laughs> um, I think it's good under preaching to be challenged, exhorted, uh, even rebuked at times, but also allured and drawn in. And when a preacher, this is what the Puritans are very good at too, when you walked out of church, you had a feeling, a profound feeling, you were in the presence of Almighty God. The whole pathos of the delivery, the, 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 the exegetical depth, the insights, the applications, the heart of the preacher, the, the, the emotion, the intensity, the zeal with which he preached, it all conveyed something consistent with the text. Uh, this is real, this is real, God is real. Um, I really believe what I'm preaching is the way the Puritans came across. So the Puritans were experts at what they called experimental or experiential preaching. And the best way I can explain that quickly is to tell you a story that when I left the active duty of the Army, I was in the Army Reserves and I could come back for, uh, for war, the boss that I was working under as a clerk typist came to me in my last day and said, you know, remember, remember if you're called back up for war one day, you gotta remember three things. You gotta remember, first of all, how to fight. You've been trained. Secondly, you've gotta remember that wars never go the way we think they go. They're bloody and messy. And third, you gotta remember the end goal. You're fighting for Uncle Sam. And later I thought about that. I thought, you know, that's a really good definition of experiential preaching, if you put it over in the Christian context. Because we've got to preach the way the Christian should live, how things ought to go in our experience, and how we ought to feel close to God, how we ought to be growing in grace, how we ought to relish our victory in Christ and the work of the Spirit in the soul. Romans 8. You know, no condemnation, no separation, more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. The Christian life is the best life in the world. We got, we got to preach that, the joys and beauties of being a Christian. But then we've got to remember we're in a spiritual warfare. And so experiential preaching also talks about Romans 7, how wars really do go. The good that I would, I find myself not doing. The evil that I would, I would not do. I find myself doing a wretched man that I am. So we've got to do Romans 7. And then we've got to do the end goal. I'm not just fighting this spiritual warfare for a nation. I'm fighting it for Christ. And one day I'm going to be with him forever. So I've got to preach from Revelation 21, marriage with Christ forever in, in everlasting glory, utopian marriage. And I think this diversity of the soul's experience, both idealistically, realistically, and optimistically, uh, is what I call experiential preaching, all of which is worked in the soul by the Holy Spirit. So experiential preaching is very closely tied in with the Spirit's work in the inner man. And the Puritans realized their dependency on the Spirit for all genuine experience. So experiential preaching refers to experience, living out the Christian life from the inner man, from the inside out. It will impact my outer life because it's in my inner life. Just, just as when I'm unsaved, my natural depravity is a heart problem. That's not just an outward problem. So from out of the heart are the issues of life, right? Proverbs 4, and Jesus speaks about it in Mark, Mark 7. Uh, from out of the heart are the issues of life. And experiential preaching aims to transform the hearer through spirit-worked regeneration and then spirit-worked sanctification so that my heart becomes more and more conformed to the image of Christ. Yep. To the Puritan mind, the spirit was central in, in preaching. So they would say, we need the Holy Spirit twice for every sermon. We need him in the, in, in the study when we're preparing it. We need him uh, on the pulpit when we preach it. And so, also in the preparation, the typical Puritan pastor 
would frequently get down on his knees in the preparation. Say, oh God, Spirit of God, help me. Help me to grasp this text deeper. I don't just want to master the text. I want the text to master me. Because as Bunyan said, I never did preach a sermon. I never preached a sermon that I did not painstakingly feel myself. And painstakingly doesn't just mean pain. It means it just got into me. And that's in the Puritan mind. That, that, that text has to master you before you get in the pulpit. That's the work of the Spirit. And then when you go to the pulpit, oh, the cries and the sighs and the fearing and the trembling, even as you go in the power of the Spirit. Like Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, I, I went before you with fear and trembling, and yet with expectation in the power of the Spirit, because God's Word never returns to me vo to Him void. So this codependency, if, if I may use that word, despite the baggage associated with, with the Holy Spirit. I'm a co-laborer with the Holy Spirit when I get on the pulpit. And so like John Calvin said, and Puritans would really embrace this, there are two preachers in every sermon. So I'm preaching the word. As I'm preaching the word, the Spirit's taking that word, taking it like arrows and putting it into his bow and shooting it out over the congregation, directing every arrow to each soul's need and giving each person what they need from that particular sermon. That's a very high view of preaching. Because then, you see, as long as I'm preaching biblically, and I'm expositing, expository preaching, I'm expositing the Bible faithfully, as long as I'm doing that faithfully, I can rest assured the Holy Spirit is going to be applying it, and particularly the more so as I get to the experiential parts of my sermon and preach about the fullness of Christ and preach about uh, how you can live out this text. Um, I, I like to think of it this way, that the Puritans would say something like this. This isn't a direct quote, so it's kind of my words, but especially when the minister gets to Christ in the sermon, after he's wounded the soul and leads the soul to Christ, for example, the spirit gets very, very active because his greatest delight is to take the things of Christ and apply them to the soul. And then the Puritans also, also would focus on after the sermon that Satan would come and, and, and take the message away. Um, and so they would go to their homes and get down on their knees in their bedroom and cry out to God for blessing afterward. How many preachers do that today? But Joseph Alliance said a preacher must go from his knees to the sermon, from his sermon back to his knees. And uh, so that just shows you their dependency. Thomas Watson said, a minister may come and knock on men's hearts, but the Spirit has the key to the heart and he must come and open the door. So you see how totally dependent the Puritan preacher was on the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Puritan mind, this is not only a good thing, but an encouraging thing. Because guess what? If I get up on the pulpit and <laughs> people come to me afterwards and say, oh, you know, the Lord used that sermon for my conversion. And if I could somehow do it, I'm going to become proud. And as soon as I become proud, I become useless. So the fact that the Holy Spirit has to do the work makes me not only dependent on the Holy Spirit, but also makes me joyful and encouraged because what the Spirit does will last forever. And so when I get up on the pulpit, yeah, am I nervous? You bet I'm nervous. I'm speaking as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. This, this is huge. Now, I'm not nervous the way I was nervous the first time I preached, but there's still this tension. I think it's a good tension inside the preacher of total dependency. Oh, God, help me. This is a major event. This is the biggest event of the life of the people of God when they gather in corporate worship. Uh, the Puritans call it the highlight of our lives, the market day of the soul. I mean, the living God of heaven and earth is coming to speak to all of us through you who is sufficient for these things. I need the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the, the Puritans were fantastic, absolutely fantastic illustrators. Why? How did, how did they get to be that way? And I'm convinced it's because they love their people so much that they wrestle with, how do you get through to your people? 
So they'd be very opposed against illustrations for illustration's sake or for, for um, time fillers. Illustrations must flow naturally out of the text, they would say. And so the, you never find Puritans going down bunny trails, do you? They're, they're, they're focused. But they get such suitable illustrations. So they said illustrations are like um, windows in a dark room that let in light. And, um, or in a stuffy room, it gives you better breathing. And when, when people hear an illustration, they sit up and listen. Boys and girls sit up and listen. So they're great attention getters as well. But illustrations are designed to make what you're saying from a two-dimensional sermon into three-dimensional. They put pictures in the minds of people. People can identify with them. Now, when I was first a preacher, I thought, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna teach so clearly and so powerfully, I'm gonna raise people above this need, this crazy need for illustrations, right? Well, then I, the few illustrations I used, I noticed that as people came to me after the sermon, they're always talking about the illustration. <laughs> and, and, and children would understand the illustrations when they didn't understand much of the sermon. So I think in my own ministry, not consciously so much, almost subconsciously, I just kind of went through a metamorphosis here and moved over to more illustrations in sermons. And I actually think, even though no Puritan said this, but Spurgeon did, and I think Puritans did something similar to this. Spurgeon said, after you've got your sermon notes prepared, go back and look over your sermon. And I forget if he said four or five. You should, be, you should have at least four or five of these window illustrations in your sermon. Now, sometime the illustration can be just I mean, many times, just from the Bible. Uh, say, a, a colorful illustration taken from one of the colorful stories about Joseph, for example, can be a great illustration because everybody in the church understands it. So the Puritans would do that a lot as well. But they were, how oh, they went to Greek mythology. They, I mean, they were all over the place with their illustrations, but always out of the, you know, always applying the text in a powerful way so that when you said, when you finish the illustration, reading the illustration or hearing the illustration, you just sat back and said, wow, yeah, that really brings the truth home, that point home to the heart. So that's a skill. And unfortunately, there aren't many good illustration books. I tried using some of those, you know, 7,700 illustrations for the preacher. Ah, they, just, they just don't work for me. So. Illustrations from your own experience, illustrations from church history, I mean, not be careful with your own experience, but illustrations from maybe experiences I've had with other people of God, talking about what they experienced can be powerful. But you have to be careful there too. You don't want people to feel like you're not confidential, so you don't take any examples from your own church, um, or, or very few. So there's borderline areas that you don't want to cross, or at least not very often. But there's a wealth of illustrations, contemporary illustrations about what's going on in the world today, uh, illustrations from um, some of the liberal arts of, of characters or things that people will know, illustrations of poor examples. Think of the Bible, you know, some Caleb is a wonderful example, but then you get Judas, Iscariot, and other poor examples. So you can use all of these things in preaching. And you're right, illustrations like that bring color into the sermon as well. And it makes, it puts fizz in the coke. It makes the sermon come alive. And so, yeah, you don't want to overload your sermon with the illustrations, but when you have, make a point, I say to the students today, when I began teaching 30 some years ago, I said, don't ever go more than 15 minutes in a sermon without some really practical application or some illustration. Today, I say, don't go more than seven minutes because people, people can't listen to straight doctrine very long. You've got to bring it home to their life or to their heart because their attention span is so short, partly due to modern media where things are just going like that, you know? So we can't preach like the Puritans that way and, and have... 15, 20 minutes of solid uh, doctrine. We need, we need illustrations.